I'm Mabel John. You're watching HD Live, the streaming video service of Health Day News. The COVID-19 outbreak has led to an explosion in the use of telemedicine between doctors and their patients. Today, our two experts dive into how telemedicine is impacting healthcare during the COVID-19 pandemic and how it could shape healthcare in the future. Joining us today are Dr. Atif Marotra, Associate Professor of Public Policy at Harvard Medical School, and Dr. Rajuta Saxena, an oncologist at Overlook Medical Center in Summit, New Jersey. Thank you both for joining us today. It's so great to see you. It's nice to be here. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Now, before the coronavirus pandemic, Americans were slow to pick up on the virtual trend. Now, according to some estimates by the American Telemedicine Association, telehealth interactions could top 1 billion by the end of 2020. Dr. Saxena, let's start with you. How did those first virtual visits go just a few months ago and how prepared were you to deliver care in this way? So telemedicine has actually been around for many decades, but we haven't been open to embracing or adopting this until this year. And I think uh, what the COVID-19 pandemic did is essentially shoehorn us into this approach, both patients and healthcare providers alike where with stay-at-home restrictions and safety as the priority, uh, we really had to try uh, our best to minimize contact, minimize exposure, mm -hmm. to keep patients safe at home, to uh, protect the PPE or personal protective equipment. So we started embracing this way of delivering healthcare rather quickly. We did undergo training when it came to the correct HIPAA compliant way of offering telehealth. Uh, initially, we started off using certain platforms like FaceTime or Duo or Skype, and then later we expanded that to some additional platforms that have since become more mainstream. And I think uh, despite the uh, abruptness of embracing this, there has been, in my experience at least, a lot of patient satisfaction, uh, which is quite surprising, but I think everyone has come to accept this way of uh, delivering healthcare. Did you feel like as a physician, you were t having to tap into a different set of skills in trying to connect with patients virtually? You, you don't have that one-on-one uh, -on face-to-face interaction, so you really have to convey more with less in these virtual visits perhaps? Yes, I think you're absolutely right. I think we have to really summon our powers of observation when it comes to televisits because we do not have the ability to perform a comprehensive physical examination. So I do pay extra attention to my patients' expressions, their nuances. I perhaps frame questions slightly differently to elicit certain responses. Uh, so I think you're right. There is certainly a new rhythm to the way we are conducting these medical uh, examinations. Mm -hmm. And uh, observation has been very important. Good communication is, again, uh, crucial uh, when it comes to televisits. So certainly, mm -hmm. yes, we are recruiting those skills, I believe, more often than we probably did with in-person visits. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that. Dr. Morotra, let me bring you in here. How has the pandemic changed the landscape of telehealth? You've been observing this sector for, for many years. Um, and are you astounded by the growth that we've seen over the past few months? Yeah, no, as Dr. Soxeno was saying, we were studying telemedicine prior to the pandemic, and it was growing. I, I should acknowledge that in particular in rural communities in the United States, we were seeing more and more telemedicine. But really, in the course of the pandemic, the growth was just staggering. Um, I think changes that we would have expected over a decade happened within weekend, uh, a week or two. Mm -hmm. And it's just really remarkable, um, such that all of a sudden it became something that went from being the future to being the reality of how a lot of Americans were getting care. Right. And what are still, still some of the downsides for healthcare providers when delivering care in this way? Yeah, no, I mean, I think like everything, there's uh, the, first just to emphasize, it's been an amazing way. And when we talk to providers, they've really emphasized and patients that this is, they've been so grateful that this opportunity does exist for them to provide the care to their patients. Um, and there are some advantages before I get to the disadvantages. Okay. The advantages are you get to see the home environment. It's easier for a lot of working parents to get to an appointment, et cetera. So there are a lot of pluses, but I also want to emphasize it's not perfect. And there have been struggles 
roles, both on the patient side and the provider side. Some of it is where, you know, uh, doctors have had to do a lot of IT support. You know, there's always the technology thing. I can't hear you. You have to unmute. Um, and that's been an issue. And some of that has been uh, in particular for um, our lower income or disadvantaged populations. They don't have the capacity or the what the fancy term is the digital literacy to actually do a visit. And so there's been a lot of concerns that this change isn't reaching all the populations we need to see. Yeah. Also, we just have to acknowledge there's some stuff you can't do via telemedicine. Mm -hmm. If you're an otolaryngologist or an ear, nose, and throat doctor and you have an ear pain, can't really yeah. look in the ear <laughs> via telemedicine. So those limitations both on the physical exam as well as you know laboratory testing and things. So let's just acknowledge that it's a great thing we've added, but it isn't doesn't fully replace all in-person visits. Well, you, you mentioned this a little bit already. I mean, how can telehealth be practiced in those areas with, with limited access? Um, for instance, people may not have a computer. Yeah. So uh, what do those folks do? Yeah, so I mean, I think that one of the things that uh, maybe isn't emphasized enough, because when we talk about telemedicine, I think the average American thinks of a video visit with their doctor. And I think it should be emphasized in the course of the pandemic, for many doctors, a lot of those telemedicine visits was an audio only visit, which is a fancy way of saying a phone call. And that just because of the limitations of the technology just didn't allow for that. Now, the nice thing is that Medicare, some states have paid for those phone visits mm -hmm. um, as a way because that would be the only way for a patient and doctor to connect. Um, and that's been one thing, but I think it has brought to a fore um, a much bigger issue is how do we increase broadband availability across the United States. That's a real issue in rural communities. And for some of our patient populations, how do we get them the equipment and the internet service that they need to have these kinds of visits? And there are a lot of policy conversation in Congress right now about how to address that. Okay. Dr. Saxanda, you've already mentioned um, how people are connecting with Skype, FaceTime, Google Hangouts. Relaxed restrictions have really allowed for this to happen. But what should physicians consider when choosing a platform to make sure that privacy and security are ensured? I think as this year has evolved, more and more platforms and vendors have offered HIPAA compliant uh, ways of communicating with patients. And you know the ones that I mentioned, uh, whether it's FaceTime or Doxy or Skype for Business are just some of them. There are so many others out there. Um, including Cisco, et cetera. And I think what's key is the ease of use. I think it has to be reliable and it also has to be easy to use from the patient perspective because a lot of our patients are elderly and not necessarily uh, able to uh, navigate technology unless it, the instructions are relatively easy to follow. And of course, consent is a big part of this process. So one of the things that we do when we log on to a televisit is obtain consent or permission from the patient. And we let them know that, hey, this is a billable medical encounter. Uh, do I have your permission to proceed to talk about things, including your health? There might be a limited uh, examination through the video if that's possible and if it's relevant. So all of these factors are, I think, important and they play into uh, which platform physicians are using. And sometimes, of course, it's mandated by the organization that you work with. So if you're part of a larger group, they might have certain preferences or restrictions. And I'm not sure how the um, uh, landscape is going to play out in terms of using televisits post COVID. But I have a feeling that there is going to be some retention of this modality, especially, and we might, in fact, be asked to use um, platforms that are uh, determined through our EMR. Hmm. Okay. So do you have thoughts on that, Dr. Marotra, what post-COVID um, telehealth is going to look like? You know, there's a really uh, a no uh, significant debate going on right now, as I mentioned, within the Congress, as well as states uh, and private health plans, because um, as uh, the has many have articulated, the genie's out of the bottle. Uh, we can't go back. And so the question has really been about, as we think both currently during the pandemic, but also post the pandemic, what should um, we pay for and what kind of visits, et cetera, are there? You know, and it's a difficult dilemma. I'll go back to the, the phone visits. While I think the phone visits have been an amazing way for 
patients and doctors to connect within the pandemic, I also do want to acknowledge that some of your listeners have, there has been a bit of a backlash because previously you called Dr. Saxena or any other doctor and you had a phone call and that was just part of something you got. And now all of a sudden you're getting a bill for $130. Mm. And while we want to value a physician's time, I think from the patient's perspective, in particular, if you're paying for that out of your pocket, out of your own pocket, there's been some little bit of grumbling and frustration with that. So it's a, it's yeah. a difficult dilemma. Yeah, I mean, in March 2020, I guess the Trump administration did lift those Medicare requirements to make these telemedicine visits easier. But how do you value what costs what, right? Well, I guess that's the age old question that we've always had to uh, yeah, no, figure out in healthcare anyway. So this is just another. Yeah, no, I think the fee for certain, the way we pay doctors is yeah. we, uh, assess how much work is required for that, their time and their expertise, and there's a dollar value applied to that. My instinct, and obviously I'm not the one making these decisions, but my instinct is that telemedicine visits moving forward will be paid less than an in-person visit because they, um, you don't have to have the rent and you don't have to pay the overhead and your nurses, et cetera, to provide those. That's my sense, but we'll find out, we'll see what happens. Okay, um, Dr. Saxena, what's your advice to healthcare workers who wanna do a good job um, providing this kind of care virtually? How do you conduct a successful telemedicine appointment? So I think there are certain nuances to conducting a televisit that are different than an in-person interaction. Uh, it's a lot of obvious stuff, you know, for example, if you're conducting a televisit from your home as a physician or healthcare provider, you want to try and be in your home office or in a room where you can close the door to minimize interruptions. You want to try and avoid being in your kitchen or a family room where the kids or the pets are going to come by and distract or disturb the conversation. Uh, that's number one. Uh, you want to be uh, punctual, as punctual as you can. You know, patients are often complaining how doctors do run behind and I understand that and we all get busy, but I think it is uh, important to be professional even when you're home and try and log on in a timely way. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're logging on, you want to try and be centered in the camera as opposed to being too close or too far away. You want to make sure your audio is turned on. You want to look professional. So oftentimes, if your patient is used to seeing you with a white coat, you might want to wear a white coat. Or if they're used to seeing you in scrubs or with your ID badge, but in just professional attire, then you might want to mimic that to try and provide a, a sense of normalcy to the visit. Um, and then, of course, you want to try and uh, minimize noise interruptions with music or cell phones. You should have them silent or muted. Uh, so these are some of the things that I think are important to try and consider when you're starting off uh, with televisits. And when might it be necessary to add components like um, buying a blood pressure cuff or a glucose monitor for at home use? So that's an excellent question. And I think it depends on the reason for the televisit. But in general, if when you are looking at a patient and you think that they look ill or not well, or they have symptoms that are concerning, most people have thermometers at home. So it's easy enough to ask them, hey, why don't you take your temperature and show me on the screen what your temperature is. If they have a blood pressure cuff at home, you can ask them to show you to take it and to show you the reading that's going to give you their pulse, their blood pressure. And if they don't, uh, that is certainly one of the recommendations you can provide so that the next follow-up visit, you have a little bit more of concrete data to go by. For example, if you're trying to adjust medications or if it's a diabetic and you're trying to uh, calibrate their insulin dosage, it would be important information that would be lacking otherwise. Hmm, okay. Dr. Marotra, is there any evidence to show that um, in the area of psychiatry that these virtual discussions can be as effective as in-person meetings and how can providers ensure that that is uh, a successful in, in that area of medicine? Yeah, no, so um, in the area, the before the pandemic and also during the pandemic, providers who provide uh, behavioral health or mental health treatment have been the doctors and uh, uh, other providers who have embraced telemedicine to a much greater degree than other um, clinical areas. And that kind of makes sense. You know, a lot of the encounters are about the conversation and facial cues and the physical exam, though important, is less important in those clinical areas as well as laboratory testing. So it's not surprising that both 
before and at, during the pandemic, it's been a clinical area where we've really seen a lot of telemedicine use. Mm -hmm. We've also, in that clinical area, we have seen a number of randomized controlled trials where they have randomized patients to telemedicine versus in-person care with a psychiatrist and followed their outcomes. And uh, across the board, those clinical trials, those small in scale, have demonstrated that telemedicine is of equal quality to an in-person visit. So in that clinical area, I think there's a good robust evidence that uh, telemedicine is a viable and safe uh, and effective way of treating patients. Mm -hmm. Okay. And are you encouraged that more people are signing up for this? I mean, I did state that at the beginning of our segment that we could be logging one billion telemedicine appointments by the time 2020 ends. That's an astounding number. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, no, I think the numbers are quite staggering. As I mentioned before, just the rate of growth that we've seen with telemedicine from being a relatively small sliver of healthcare to a much larger fraction. I don't know about those numbers, uh, just to, you know, we have initially during the pandemic, we saw a huge surge of telemedicine um, uh, up uh, because that was the only option. Now that physician offices across the country have reopened uh, generally. Now we're seeing that use of telemedicine decline to some degree, and I think we're going to reach a new steady state. But I don't think it's going to be the majority of the care we provide via telemedicine. My instinct, based on what I'm seeing, is in the 7 to 8% of visits will be somewhere using telemedicine, which is a huge change for us pri from prior to the pandemic. But I also want to create a cautionary note that it isn't that it will be the only way that people will get care. Right. Okay. And Dr. Saxena, is there anything that you're going to be adding to your um, way of delivering this kind of care as you learn more as the months go by? I think I've become more comfortable with it and I've seen the benefits of telemedicine. It was, to be honest with you, new for me. Uh, it wasn't something I had really participated in prior to the pandemic. So after having witnessed the benefits, especially for my elderly patients or those that have trouble with mobility, ambulation, or who live far away, I think it's something that I hope to continue using for follow-up visits or for visits that include more of a consultation that's verbal as opposed to a visit that's centered on physical examination or diagnostics. So, you know, for those patients that need to come in for blood work or scans, of course, we would try and combine everything on the same day if possible. But there are certainly a lot of patients, especially in oncology, who have a scan done, and then we need to discuss the results with them and, and come up with a plan. And I think it's important to select out those patients who would benefit the most from telemedicine and continue that as a way of providing care for them. I might also yes, add please. that uh, one of the things that has happened here is this happened very, very suddenly, as we've both described. And so uh, I, I think we should also acknowledge that we, and I say we as a clinical community, the physician community is still figuring this out. Mm -hmm. And where is the right way? How can we use it? In all these clinical areas, there's a lot of like little experiments going on about how's the what are the best ways to use telemedicine? I heard a, a colleague describe in the area of oncology that the use of telemedicine was very helpful because she was able to get the, the patient's children on the same call in a way that previously wouldn't have been a, a possible with a in-person visit because they were scattered across the country. That's just one example, I think, of how both patients and doctors are experimenting and learning as we go in terms of trying to figure out what's the best applications for telemedicine. And as you alluded to, Mabel, before, how can we use technology within the home to facilitate them and make sure we have all the information we need? All right. All right. Dr. Atif Marotra of Harvard Medical School and Dr. Rajuda Saxena of Overlook Medical Center. Thank you so much. It was great to see you both. For more health news, remember to check us out at live.healthday.com, on our Facebook page at Health Day News, and on Twitter at Health Day Tweets. I'm Mabel Jong. Have a safe and healthy day.